So I've written this opening about 10 times now, and it seems I may be the only person who has played this game through who actually enjoyed it, at least from the group of creators that can play Japanese games and talk about them in English. In fact, one of whom I respect a lot equated this game with wanting to pee on its burning ashes. I guarantee you now, saying it truthfully, critics and reviewers will crucify this game. So I'm going to be upfront. This game has issues, but yet I found myself really, really, really loving the payoff. Because of this, I want to make sure I can communicate all the necessary information for you to make a decision with purchasing this game. Therefore, this review may go on a bit longer than usual, so please feel free to use the timestamps if you need a break. With that said, let's find out what's going on with this old school ego. Released in Japan in November 2021, Monarch is a new IP from Furyu cut from the same vein as the Caligula Effect. Now, while Caligula Effect had X developers persona behind the wheel, Monarch uses X SMT developers, which is quite evident early on. The premise of the story revolves around a nameless MC and the events unfolding at his private high school. After the opening cutscenes, the school is, in short, immediately shifted out of reality, bound in a sort of barrier. Within this barrier, there is a mist that impacts the mental health and stability of the students and faculty. The source of this mist is an alternative reality of sorts, which is described as the underworld, the realm of the ego, which is accessible via calling a phone number. Various entities exist here that are generally referred to as demons, created by the various egos of humans. The mist itself is generated by individuals who are able to manipulate these forces by making a contract with demons of the highest rank. This grants them the power of authority, making them the titular monarch. The MC who gains these powers must go through the mist and methodically remove the effects of the fog floor by floor, building by building to uncover the truth. Personally, I found this very engaging as there is sort of an open world element with how you go about freeing the school. You can choose where to go and what to start. Chapters, so to speak, are based around extended character episodes around the beginning. This sort of functions like the Caligula effect, where the story is centered on the cast and their individual situations. Now, characters themselves are a love it or hate it condition, which is a big point of contention. In all, you have your MC and four characters who become your party. I would say two of them are good, one is okay, and the last one you will definitely hate. Without going too much into it, most of the characters share certain aspects of their personality, and their personal motivations are limited. Without going into too much, it has a sort of classic brand of atmosphere that comes from an old school style of SMT. Now, I need to get this out of the way. Um, this game has X devs from SMT working on it. No, Nisa has not advertised this as an SMT. So, no, this game is not SMT, especially as many of you may know it. These devs are from the very, very, very old school SMTs. And no, I'm not talking like Nocturne. I'm talking more like Avatar Tuner, Devil Tuner, like 1980s SMT. Now, for me, I found this old school sense really charming and in a strange way, refreshing. But I wouldn't go out and say that this is bad SMT. It's an older style which has influenced the title of this review. This isn't your parents' SMT. It's more like your grandparents' SMT. Now, tonal-wise, it follows this to the T. From the opening cutscenes and onward, everything had an old-school horror feel. Do note, though, that this game keeps to that old-school style, so the environments are not really that varied. All battles are done in a single realm, which doesn't have too much visual variation. Again, helpful for tone, but not really something many gamers now would appreciate. For me, at times, it honestly felt sort of like a JRPG Resident Evil. And this was exacerbated a lot by all of the puzzles this game throws at you. Yes, there are puzzles and they're quite intricate. Many involve you needing to gather information and clues to solve unlocking a safe or logging into someone's PC. They are information games that necessitate searching through your profile book, collected documents, and small notes found throughout the levels. In all, they do well adding to the atmosphere, but for some it may be a bit of a turnoff, especially as these puzzles don't serve too deeply into the larger plot and are sometimes tedious during Act 2. 
Performance-wise, I mentioned in my first impression of this video that graphics do feel rough around the edges, especially with some of the in-game renders. Again, this is likely more optimized for the PS4, but I'll take the portability. With that said, during late game, I did experience some frame rate drops, and there was a glitch with maps that have a teleporter, as there was a chance that a unit placed at a strange angle may result in clipping through the level. However, with that said, the devs have been very active with this game and have fixed the said problem. So kudos to them. I'm not sure if the PS4 has these same issues, but I can say that I have had no issues with glitches and crashes since the December update. Finally, I need to touch on the audio. From the outside, Monarch seems quite straightforward in its compositions. They're very fitting and set the mood well, but really straightforward. What you may not be aware of is Furyu is working in collaboration with Kamitsubashi Studio to provide some virtual idol J-pop bangers for the boss battles. Once again, I'm recommending Ash by the artist Coco for anyone who hasn't listened to it yet. This song definitely sets the tone for the first boss. Also, the VO in Japanese is an amazing. They did an absolute banging job. So let's jump in and see the game in action. Monarch describes itself as a dark school strategy RPG. In essence, this is indeed the case, though I'd like to point out it plays a lot like the Legend of Heroes series. Battles are played out on a small battlefield generated by the phone number used. Prior to the battle, you can select your combatants and view enemy forces. Once in battle, a turn-based tactics battle system dictates the flow of combat. During your turn, you can select any of your units at will and flow through the typical motions of movement, act, and end. While movement is optional, performing any actionable ability immediately locks the selected unit from further use of that turn. For this reason, it's important to consider the unit's proximity and direction to the enemy, as bonuses to damage and accuracy are granted for back attacks. Additionally, units can counterattack if facing their attacker. To play into this mechanic, a support system exists where if your allies are nearby an assaulted enemy, they will automatically attack as well. This effect can lead to 4 or 5 hit combos dealing massive damage. Needless to say, this is a critical aspect for battles, so do be sure to really think about your positioning. In terms of character actions during a battle, all characters have access to physical attacks, authority skills, which is basically magic, reordering, which allows a unit to give their turn to another unit that has already gone, items, and resting, which restores a bit of your life points. With exception to item usage and restoration, around 90% of all skills require some cost, which is either a deduction of your health points or an increase to your madness gauge. So, now I suppose a good time to discuss the ego system, which is the main crux of the game. It's broken down into two parts, a personality evaluation and what I personally refer to as the stability system. At the start of the game, you're given a personality quiz of sorts with the intention of setting your personality levels. As the game progresses, you'll be able to add your scores through winning battles and uncovering small one-question tests, the goal of which is to unlock overall stat bonuses for the team via a social link causality system. To just note really quick, you don't actually need to do much with this. Uh, it's not nearly as complicated. Just talking to people and unlocking their entry in your personnel file seems to be more than enough. The personality system also dictates your starting legion. Legion are homunculi that represent the various parts of your ego. In battle, they function as various job classes, such as ranged mage, support healer, defensive tank. At the start of the game, you only have access to one legion, which is based on your highest ego stat after that personality quiz. However, as you progress more, additional ones will unlock, allowing you to expand your combat effectiveness. Otherwise, the ego system doesn't really contribute to much else, aside from just level restrictions on some legion equipment and those uh, ultra egos I mentioned before, which is the permanent stat boosts. The other part of the ego system is what I refer to as stability. Basically, you have a madness gauge that represents your psyche. Your madness increases when using certain skills in battle or as you explore miscovered areas. When at 100%, it can either knock you out on the school map, placing you back in the infirmary, or if this happens in battle, you will get arraigned, you will get enraged, and your character will attack anything and anyone indiscriminately without your control, which results in a literal self-destruction after three turns. This deals massive damage and basically kills yourself. 
Do note that some skills and abilities can cause more damage if your madness gauge is higher, so it is a sort of risk reward system. To lower madness, you'll need to win battles, heal at the nurse's office, or cause an awakening during a fight. Now, awakenings happen when your awakening gauge is at max. By using a special boosting skill, or by landing attacks successfully, uh, at 100%, your character will enter a sort of limit break stake, which is the awakening state. When this happens, your madness gauge will be reset to zero, and you will not be able to gain any additional madness from skills used, so you are feel free to go ham. Furthermore, if you have it unlocked, you also have access to a super special attack super special super powered attack there we go that can usually one shot enemies additionally if you are really crafty you can get both full madness and awakening at the same time this leads to a really super powered buff called enlightenment in the english version and that's all i'm going to say for that in essence you'll need to be mindful of your gauges to ensure you remain in control of the battle while this all sounds really complicated, in fact, everything is presented very clearly and it's pretty easy to mitigate at first. This lets newcomers in fairly easily with a system that veterans can aim to exploit, especially when you talk about the skills. Speaking of skills, as you defeat enemies, you'll get drops and you'll accumulate spirit points. These spirit points are used to unlock and upgrade skills in your menu. Leveling is solely based around this concept. So, as you buy and upgrade your skills, your character's base level also increases. Now, there is a single pool of spirit points that everyone levels from. So, don't forget to use your points, but be sure that you balance out your levels between all of your members. In an interesting twist, Monarch doesn't actually have difficulty modes. Instead, there is a casual mode you can turn on at the start and adjust at any time. This mode lessens the damage taken, lowers madness level gained, and increases the item drop rate. I've only ever used it for farming as it seems to make the process easier, but otherwise you don't necessarily need to turn it on. With that said, I feel that the AI is well constructed in Monarch. The AI takes form in the aforementioned units known as a Legion. These units have different weapon types, from greatswords to hellbirds, each with their own character classes as abilities. More importantly, their behavior is optimized to maximize their combat effectiveness with each other. This includes buffs and strategic attacks against specific enemies. Additionally, their damage output can get really high at later levels, so do be careful. Now, bosses also play into this point, but they get downright ridiculous and sometimes frustrating. You see, if the MC gets killed, it's instant game over. So it's not uncommon to spend 15 to 20 minutes making your way through a horde of superpowered legions to get one shot critted by a boss. And yes, you heard me. Some like a battles can be upwards to 30 or more minutes, depending on the circumstances. So be warned, and I do speak from experience on this. However, when you do finally win, it is a victory well deserved. You'll need good prep, placement, and strategy to navigate the missions. Finally, there are no random encounters. All battles must be invoked directly, so be prepared for a grind. Between floors and levels, the overall enemy level increases about 5 to 6 each time. Luckily, the game offers a lot of support for you with this. Which brings me to another point that many, many people hate. The grind. I guarantee you, you will be spending a good amount of time grinding. The game actually has stages specifically built for grinding, and if you're going for the true end, expect about 15 to 20 hours of grinding alone. This will be a turnoff, I know. However, once you figure out the easy ways to do this, it becomes much, much quicker. I'll be publishing more videos that go into this deeply, so stay tuned for that. In all, this game doesn't play around and expects you to give it its full attention. Veterans, I think, will enjoy the challenge, but definitely be offset by that grind later. For newcomers, I could see a lot of people not finishing this game just due to the difficulty. I will say that there is a good sense of achievement when winning, but you'll need to be patient when doing so. So, a few small things I want to mention. At the start of every new area, your boy Vanitas will give you a phone number to call. Call it immediately and make a beeline for the crystal and destroy it. 
This stops an exploration mechanic that is called the Death Call. Basically, when you're exploring at a certain level of madness, if you get, uh, you'll be forced into an impossible encounter. Kind of like the death mechanic from Tartar, like Tartarus and all of the old Persona games. Now, every time you enter a new area, you must do this, so make it a part of the routine. Second, empathy, or resonance, as the English dub calls it, is an extremely unique and helpful authority skill only for the MC. It allows you to link with any or all units of his choosing. When doing this, all of the linked units share buffs, debuffs, and awakening status. This is a great way to superpower your team as a whole and to deal high damage quickly. Furthermore, some enemies, or I shouldn't say some enemies, all enemies can be empathized or reson resonated with as well. This is an excellent way to stonewall some bosses from using their superpower skills. Master Empathy. It's extremely helpful in game and in real life. Now, when you're dealing with your levels, priority goes to the, aim, to the, to the MC, hands down. I would suggest focusing on a few legions though, as some have very, very broken skills. Particularly, Lust. Lust is your battle mage. High powered, all hitting magic with a crossbow. This is imperative for late game grinding. Next up, Pride. This is your healer. Can give good buffs and do great heals. Get this second if you can. Uh, as it will be given to you automatically after you finish chapter one. So try to avoid pride at the beginning of the game. Next up, greed. This is a for, sort of melee debuffer. Uh, good strong hits, can debuff enemies and take away their buffs. Uh, has access to a two and four hit sword combo that just wrecks everything when doing back attacks. Finally, take advantage of the fertility garden levels for grinding you'll get bonus spirit for just completing the level itself. I will be posting more videos on how to do levels and grinding later on, so stay tuned for that. I suppose after all the trek, the question left is, Sho, why did you enjoy this game so much? To be honest, it scratched an itch. It wasn't trying to do something new. It wasn't trying too hard for me to like it. Rather, this game just feels like it was made by a bunch of older guys looking to go back to older times. Perhaps it's nostalgia then. The issue I think with this game is that it's packaged as a new formula. If this was done in, let's say, a 2.5D HD style using old school sprites, I think the perception that this game gets would be a lot more positive. Come to think of it, with all of the old IPs coming back in updated ways, such as the recent Front Mission and Live or like Live Alive announcements, perhaps the industry realizes that there's nowhere else to go. Hmm. So, should you still buy this game? I don't want to take away your agency and say yes or no. But I will say that this is an old school style game in a new school style body that really drops a challenge in your lap. So... Take that as it is. All right. Well, if you've made it here, thank you so much for watching. Honestly, I am really still excited to talk about this game more, and I have a lot of videos coming out probably in the next week or so that will cover demonstrations of battle mechanics, how to achieve all the trophies, helpful farming techniques, and late game, post game content materials that will help everyone out because, well, you'll find out when the video gets released. So if that sounds good, if you can send your love by subscribing to the channel and liking, sharing the video with others, I mean, honestly, thank you so much for all the love you send and support so far. It really does encourage me to keep posting. So thanks for watching. And remember, if the going gets tough, let's switch strats. Cheers.